Hi, everybody. I'm Rich Kuzma, an engineering manager and aspiring rationalist at Constant Contact. Now, software developers are all about building great products. And as an engineering manager, I'm always asking myself, how can I help developers improve this so they can build even greater products? Now, this talk today is not about the latest JavaScript framework. It's not about designing infinitely scalable architectures. This talk is about sharpening your sword so you can get better at those things and better at, well, everything. So just a quick point of protocol. Um, if you have a distracting thought during the presentation, like, uh, I don't know, oh, I forgot to swap the laundry over this morning, or uh, I don't know, hey Rich, what you just said there is totally wrong and here's why, uh, just jot it down, take a note, clear your mind. Uh, I promise the slides will be available afterwards. And um, uh, finally, if, uh, if you learn anything out of this talk, I would encourage you to please steal it, copy it, make it your own. Uh, that's one of the best ways we can learn. So, all right. So during today's conference, uh, just a quick note on the agenda. I'm gonna go over uh, just a quick background of the brain um, and a, a useful abstraction model for reasoning about how we think, um, including some um, techniques for uh, hacking uh, our behaviors to uh, better achieve what we want. Also going to spend some time talking about loss aversion and several defects or cognitive biases that are in our brains. Um, I believe that just being aware of the bugs that are going on in our minds um, at least gives us a fighting chance at being able to work around them. I'll also give you some techniques for uh, solving some of these problems. And I'll close with a uh, uh, discussion of the autonomic nervous system and how being aware of it and how it impacts your, uh, your body uh, can help you to fight mission critical production defects. So without further ado, this is hacking the brain. Right. Our brains have about 100 billion neurons, each operating at about 100 instructions per second. Now compare that with the Apple II from 1977, this thing was operating at 1,000 instructions per second. Right? Compare that to the Mac laptop that is running this presentation that is running at like 2.4 billion instructions per second. And so I'm always amazed, you know, how is it that we as a species manage to, to rise to the top of the food chain right? and, and build battery-powered pencil sharpeners or uh, fly to the moon? Um, all on a, 100 instructions per second. You know? Well, the answer to that, in part, is massive parallel computation, but another part of it is caching. Now, caching lets us do some, um, some pretty cool things. Nice catch, all right. Um, in fact, caching drives, uh, sort of this cached response, drives a lot of what we do during the day. Um, but as we all know, uh, in computer science, you know, caching is one of those um, particularly hard problems in computer science, right? What is it like naming things and caching are like the two things that are just a pain to figure out? Well, it turns out that um, in nature as well, um, caching is, is particularly hard to figure out, right? Because one, one of the hard things with caching is, you know, when do you invalidate the cache, right? <laughs> Turing surprise. You see, right now you're invalidating your cache, you're updating it, you're thinking, Rich, next time I won't be surprised, right? I know you've got a yo-yo, I'm not going to flinch, I'm not going to try to catch a marker. No, I'm updating it so next time you'll be ready, right? You've updated this, this cache. So this is pretty cool. How does that work? Well, I'll turn to a guy named Daniel Kahneman. Uh, he's a psychologist, behavioral economist. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize. Uh, for some of his research, more on that a little bit later. Um, Daniel Kahneman wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. And in this book, he describes a model or a, a, an abstraction layer for thinking about how we think. It's not a physical model, it's just a, a mental model. And it helps us to think of our brain in two systems, system one and system two. Now, system one is that sort of effortless, intuitive, immediate response, right? This is the part of your brain that answers what is two plus two. Right? It's like right there on the tip of your tongue, it's the front of your mind, right? And uh, it's also particularly effortless, right? A lot of our cash responses you just do. You don't have to think about doing them. They just, they just kind of come naturally. Now, 
in, uh, in software engineering, this is a lot like, uh, I don't know, if you're coding, this might be like hitting shift command F or something to like format your code or just rattling off a for loop, right? It's not something you have to think about. Your brain just knows how to do it. Uh, contrast that with system two. This is the, the logical, rational um, reasoning part of your, of your mind. And this is the system that helps solve problems like what's, you know, 24 times 17. You know, that's, that's not like right at the tip of your tongue, or at least me, I'm an engineering manager, so that's not right at the tip of my tongue. Um, but uh, um, one of the differences between you know, system two and system one is, uh, you know, system two is a lot more effortful, right? This is operating also a lot slower than your system one is, right? Now, imagine, uh, for example, I were to throw, I don't know, uh, I won't throw anything at you again, I promise. Um, imagine, uh, I don't know, I were to throw uh, a hamburger at you, right? And you were to try to catch that hamburger with your system too. All right, well, what would happen? Well, first, you, know, you might be thinking, what, why is this guy throwing a hamburger at me? Um, you might be thinking, well, is that hamburger hot or cold? Like, is it okay to catch it? Should I duck out of the way or, or should I catch it? And then you might decide, okay, I'm going to catch that hamburger. So what do you do? Oh, I got to like, you know, expand my arm muscle and I got to like, expand this finger digit and this one and this one and then compute the trajectory of the hamburger as it's flying past me and, and what happens? Um, so system one, you know, obviously can let us uh, handle some, some pretty complex tasks. Um, for example, I'd argue that it, it powers almost everyone's commute every morning, right? And in fact, for those of you uh, driving here today, um, you, you might as well not have even been behind the wheel, right? Your system one is taking over. Your system one is handling all the complicated computations of, you know, how do I merge, watch out for cars. But if you ask yourself, did you... Did you go through any traffic lights today? You know, were they all green? Hope so. Uh, you know, did you go through any tolls? Did you remember to pay them? And uh, uh, this is because system one is taking over and it's, um, it's a lot better at handling these kinds of tasks. Also, I want to point out that um, when you're using system one, it's very, very low on willpower. And as we know, willpower is one of these finite resources. Right? You can really drain it. Um, it's good, but you, you can't use it too much. Well, I'd argue that your drive on 128 used far less willpower than just getting up in the morning. Right? Now, system one's great, but it doesn't always work. You know, consider, for example, uh, you know, the first snowstorm of the year in New England and everybody forgets how to drive. Um, and what's, let's just kind of walk through what's happening, right? So let's say you're, you're driving along, you know, you're paying attention, right? And you're looking out the window, you're checking your phone, right? And then suddenly your car hits a patch of ice. Right? And what happens? Your system one is screaming. It's like, stop, break, break, don't, don't proceed, right? Exactly the wrong thing to do, right? You don't want to break on the ice. Now, alternatively, if you could have like page faulted or somehow given your system two a chance to interrupt and intervene and use a little bit of logic, it might have said, wait a minute, you're on ice. You don't have traction. Consider pumping your brakes, you know, turn into the slide, right? Get some traction and then, and then slow down. Um, but most of the time, system one gets it right. Now, thinking about system one, it, it seems like a, a pretty powerful, effortless way of doing certain actions. And wouldn't it be cool if we could hack our system one to doing other kinds of actions, right? To make other things more um, effortless. Like, for example, I'm a, I'm a big cognitive science junkie. I'm all about, you know, like, neuroscience and how do we increase cognitive function and whatnot. And one of the things I always hear from, from neuroscientists, researchers, is they say, you know, the way you improve your brain, you know, get a, just a baseline jump on everybody else, is simple. Let's eat, sleep, and exercise. Oh, great! Y'all want to do that? That's awesome. Well, we all know wanting something is not the same as a plan, right? And now, actually stating that you want to do something does have like a 20 to 30 percent variance on your behavior, um, but it's not really that accurate, right? Well, there's a system. Um, for kind of tricking your brain um, into doing uh, different actions that help you reach your goals faster. I kind of, I like to think of the brain as like this big stupid elephant that you can like train to do things. Um, so one of the tricks you can do, um, I've learned is called a trigger action plan. Um, it's also known as implementation intentions. A psychologist named Peter Gallwitzer came up with this technique. And it works like this. You figure out some goal, some behavior that you want to instill, right? Maybe it's eat, sleep, or exercise. And you you visualize a specific, very specific trigger condition and then a specific action that you want to take. It's kind of like 
like loading an if-then condition into your system one. And these things are kind of cool. You can even like chain them together and they have a pretty long uh, time to live. But uh, let me give you a couple examples how this works. We're talking about eat, sleep, and exercise, right? Well, I want to eat better. And people say, you should go on a diet. Like, yeah, I really should. Yeah, I should. It's a really low chance of actually happening. Um, instead, I'm going to come up with a specific trigger condition and a specific action that I'll take. Uh, for me, the trigger condition is when I'm about to open a can of Mountain Dew, I'm going to immediately pause, turn, fill up a cup of water. Now, I'm not committing to drinking that cup of water. And for me, this works because, well, at constant contact, the Mountain Dew and the water are co-located. So there's a reasonable chance that, that I can do this all the time. And, uh, and I just trust that my system one will take it from there. So next time I grab the Mountain Dew, about to open it, grab the water. Now I might decide, you know what, I'm really tired. I need some caffeine and sugar and I'll take the Mountain Dew. That's fine. But I've at least given myself a chance. I've increased the chances that I'm going to reduce my, my soda intake. Another example is how important it is to sleep regularly. Um, you, know, you don't sleep enough. You, get, you can get anxiety. You, know, you don't think as clearly the next day. Especially, you know, engineers, we're like burning the midnight oil, trying to get, get coding assignments done. Sleeping regularly and sleeping well is so important for cognitive function. Um, one of the taps, the trigger action plans, that I've installed um, is when I, when I go to bed at night, maybe you guys are the same, you have like your phone near your nightstand, right? And you, get, you go to bed and you know, pull up the phone, look at Hacker News, you're like reading Reddit, and before you know it, like an hour and a half has gone by and you're like, oh man, it's gonna be a long day tomorrow, I'm really tired. So I installed a tap for myself which says, when I touch the phone, just pause, do a five minute mindful meditation. And that works for me. It's something I kind of know how to do. Um, but hopefully you get the idea. Find some trigger that's in your environment and a specific action that has a high probability of, of taking effect to nudge you closer to that goal. Um, if you just, just one more example, hopefully this, this helps drill at home. This is something that a lot of the engineers on my team are doing now. Um, it's kind of this joke. Everybody comes up. I'll explain in a minute. The trigger goes like this. Um, instead of uh, taking the elevator at work, I want to take the stairs. Right? It's a really simple, small way to get a little bit of exercise, right? And if you're an Iron Man, you, you might actually be out of breath coming up the top of the stairs. Um, so the trigger that I set up for myself was when I get to the elevator, I'm going to turn and take the stairs, right? And it didn't work. It turned out for me, I needed a much more specific trigger. It was like when I, when I approach the platform, like there's this little step right before the elevator, and like as soon as I step on it, that's my trigger to like turn and take the stairs, all right? And so I tried it out, let my system one do it, and the next day I go to work and I like get effortless. I didn't even have to think about it. It's like, duh, you just go take stairs. That's what you do. And it worked. And so now I don't even know like the elevator's there and then other guys are doing it and so everyone comes to stand up and they're all like out of breath. <sighs> like, ah, trigger action plan, right? Yeah, you did it, cool. Um, so just to give you guys, give an opportunity to try it, um, do you guys have any, any habits or goals that that you want to form, maybe behaviors you want to change? Think of a, of a trigger. Any, uh, any volunteers? Oh. Everybody's perfect. I see, I see one in the back. Yeah? I want to go to the gym more. All right, want to go to the gym more. Okay. Um, so can you think of, a, uh, think of a specific trigger that has a kind of related to your routine that, that might work? Over the gym, okay. Um, and so, what's the what's the specific action? So you got it. So you're like, all right. After the dishes are done, I put the last dish in the sink. We'll get a little bit more specific. What's the action that you'll take? Close the dishwasher. All right. Okay. And what a what action are you going to take to get in your car to go to the gym? Let's refine it a little bit more. Let's get something a little bit more specific because get in the car involves like all this effort, right? You have to like. Maybe, I don't know, get your gym bag, you know, like open the door, you're going to get to the car. Is there something that gets you a little bit closer to going to the gym, maybe helps you commit a little bit more than, than that? Putting you on the spot, Susan. <laughs> all right, all right. Cool. 
Awesome. I like it. So um, just some other ideas for specific triggers. I know that, that people have done um, for trigger action plans for going to the gym. Um, sometimes you can also set up different cues or um, hindrances on the way. Like it might be, like for me in the morning, it's when I wake up, um, I've already got my socks laid out. And for me, the trigger to actually do Tabata sprints and like run for four minutes, which I hate, but whatever, four minutes, I can do it, um, is to put my socks on. I don't know. So like the action is as soon as I get up, put my socks on. And then like, well, I already got my socks on. I might as well just like go run, right? I don't know, it just works for me. But again, that idea of think about a very specific trigger and a specific action you can take to get you incrementally on your way towards your goal. Um, just want to point out, um, thank you, Susan. That was a great example. Um, just want to point out as well, uh, certain triggers that don't work very well are time-based triggers. You know, so you might say that, okay, at, uh, I don't know, maybe you're trying to write blog posts and you're saying at, at two o'clock every day, I'm going to set an alarm, and I'm going to sit down and write awesome blog posts, like every Monday. Right? This is, has a really low chance of happening because you might be busy at 2 o'clock. Right? And there's also not a very specific action that you're taking there. It's like, write. Well, I don't know. You might need to get started. So um, just as an alternative example, if you, if you get it, something that's more contextual in your environment, you know, it could be, I don't know, at night, you're like lowering the blinds on your shade, and you're about to sit on the bed. It could be, OK, that's my trigger. Lowering the blinds, the action is grab the pencil and paper. And so it's something that you do all the time every day. It's a time when you're probably not going to be interrupted. You'll have a much better chance of, of doing it. And this also works for uh, mental triggers as well, as we'll get to in the next part of the, uh, of the talk. So OK, beyond habit formation, eat, sleep, exercise, I know. But we all want to become better engineers, right? This isn't a life hacker conference. This is an engineers for engineers conference, right? Um, well, I'm going to shift gears for a minute uh, in part two and talk about loss aversion. Uh, that guy, Daniel Kahneman, the psychologist, behavioral economist. Um, so he won the Nobel Prize in economics for uh, some work that he did with a guy named Amos Tversky um, to uh, prove this concept called loss aversion. Kind of a complicated graph. You don't really have to pay attention to it. Um, loss aversion it basically says, like, surprise, humans are not rational economic actors. And in fact, we tend to feel pain like twice as much as we feel a comparative gain. Right? And this is like proven study after study after study. This is like truth. Right? Psychologically, loss feels twice as worse as a comparative gain. Now, I don't know if any of you guys have seen, um, it's an old movie, Stand and Deliver. Um, anybody see that movie? Maybe a couple people. Okay. Anyway, Edward James Olmos is in this movie, and he's trying to teach kids in the inner city, in the inner city calculus, right? And he starts out the class, and he says to everybody, "You all have an A in my class. It is yours to lose, right?" And everyone's like all excited. For many of them, it's like the first time they ever had an A. They're they're great, right? He probably got between like 0.2 and 0.4 standard deviation points of a variance on his students' behavior. They probably worked that much harder because they had an A and it was something that they could lose. We want to hold on to what we have uh, more than we want to grasp something in the future. And why does this matter to us? Let's tie it back to software engineering. Well, loss aversion helps explain this other effect called um, the endowment effect, also known as the IKEA effect, where we tend to displace uh, an inordinate amount of value on an object that we, that we create ourselves versus a similar object. So like the Lexvic coffee table that you built, it's like, wow, that is so much more valuable than the Lexvic that my neighbor built, right? Because you, you build it, you put your own blood, sweat, and tears in there, right? I mean, this really rings home. I think about code reviews. I think about, um, I've got some code that I'm, I'm going to show my peers and get feedback on it. I would argue that the you know, similar looking code written by another engineer, you may be way more um, prone or open to giving feedback on or critiquing it than your own. You tend to put a lot more value in that thing that you've created. You hold on to it more. You don't want to break it, right? Like you don't want to, you don't want to dismantle it. It's a work of art, right? We want to hang on to what we have. So be aware of this cognitive bias. It's, um, I would say, one of the techniques you can use for um, defeating it would be, I don't know, maybe you're about to open a pull request, right? And the trigger could be, stop, pretend I am, I don't know, think of like really smart engineer in your team. What would I say about this PR, right? 
Now you're looking at it objectively. You're not thinking about it as your own work. You've kind of shifted your mindset thinking about someone else. And um, you'll be a lot more open to, to changing that. Um, also, this gets back to um, the talk that Kiwi gave this morning about giving feedback. She talks about always asking for feedback on your code reviews. Big tip, do it early. If you wait until you're all done, you're going to be you're suffering from all these biases, right? You're going to be far less open to changing it. You don't want to let go of what, what's already 100% done. So try doing it at like 80% or 50%. Uh, loss aversion is also, uh, also plays a role in the status quo effect. We all know how hard it is to affect change in organizations. Um, again, we, we want to hold on to what we have. Well, uh, this is, is particularly problematic, especially when you couple it with negativity bias. Um, anybody have an engineer on your team who's like always shooting down everybody's ideas? Okay, or, or maybe it's yourself, I don't know. Um, so it's like particularly insidious because um, we tend to, uh, when we hear something negative, um, it has far more influence over something positive. Right? So you couple that with the status quo effect, you're like, change just gets that much harder. So what I would say is, you know, if you, if you notice this happening in your team, you know, call it out, or at least call it out to yourself if you're not comfortable saying, hey, negativity bias, you know, but at least be aware of it um, so you can see when it happens and you can correct or update um, your judgment on whether something's a good idea or not. Um, be aware if you're being unduly influenced just by negative uh, feedback. Last part of loss aversion uh, I'm going to talk about is uh, the sunk cost fallacy. And again, all that work by Daniel Kahneman also helps to slightly prove this phenomenon as well. Um, you know, you may have heard of this as, I don't know, like we spent $10 billion on the big dig. What's one billion more? Right now, MBAs and POs, do you guys get like drilled into your head in business school? Like, you know, sunk costs are sunk. You know, you do, not, you do not factor those into whether or not you do something or you continue to do work on a particular project. Um, and so, okay, I, I think to myself, yeah, I get it, right? I don't do that. I don't do that. But let's, let's turn it around a bit and think of, of ourselves just as, as developers. Maybe it's a, I don't know, Friday night, you're on the way home, and you got this, like, stroke of genius. Like, ah, oh, I know how to solve this one problem, or I know a really awesome thing to build. And you go home and you're like, get on the computer and you're hacking and you're going, you're like going all night, like all weekend. And you're putting together this beautiful work of art. You've got unit tests and you've got great code quality and you've written wiki docs and all this stuff. It's like, this is going to be awesome. My team is going to love me. This is going to change the world, right? And then Monday, you've got a good night's sleep. You're driving in and there's this little like, huh, little thought gnawing at the back of your mind that says, maybe this doesn't actually solve the original problem. But whatever, I mean, look at the code, it's awesome, and I spent all weekend on it. I can't just throw it away. Yeah, it doesn't solve the problem, but so what? I'm sure we can find a way. You're rationalizing now, right? This is like not a good thing to do. Um, I'm sure we can find a way to make this code, um, to ship this code. You're falling victim to the sunk cost fallacy. It doesn't matter how much time you spent on the project. If it's not a good, valuable feature, don't put it in the code. Just don't ship it. So try to use more, um, more discipline and be aware of that, particularly with yourself when you're working on projects. So we talked a lot about loss aversion. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some cognitive biases. These are like bugs in our brains. And um, uh, one of the things to keep in mind is uh, as we're going through these cognitive biases, you may wanna think of some trigger action plans that you could you know, set up conditions where like if I notice I'm falling victim to this bias, like, I'll be aware and take some action to overcome it. Also, um, my hope is that, that maybe some of these biases will become part of your, your vernacular among your teams, where you'll be able to call out some of the things that you see. We're going to start out with an exercise. Now, if you've done this before, this is the Watkins rule test. Um, maybe just refrain from participating. Uh, I don't want to root for everybody else. It goes like this. I'm thinking of a rule that these three numbers satisfy. I want you to guess the rule. Now, how do you guess the rule? It could be so many rules. Well, you can give me any three number sequences that you want until you're confident that you know what the rule is. So I'm going to ask for a volunteer to, to come up. Anybody? Try this out. I promise. It'll be fun. It'll be cool. It's all in the name of science. Be aware of bystander effect. Okay. Oh, come on up. Thanks. Volunteer.
Hey, hey, John. All right, John. So um, I guess I'll ask you first off, do you know what the rule is? Can you guess? Uh, even numbers? Uh, nope, that's, uh, nope, that's not the rule. Maybe uh, do you want to give a couple of guesses sure. what you think it might be? Um, you increment by two? Or? Give me, uh, instead of just guessing the rule right away, let's try to come up with some sequences uh, that you think might fit the rule, and then I'll tell you that we have like a higher chance of getting it right. Okay. okay. Yes, that fits the rule. Oh, thanks, Eric. <laughs> Eight, 10, yep, that fits the rule. 16, 18, 20. Yes, that fits the rule. Uh, 20, 24, 28. Yes, also fits the rule. You, you think you might know what it is? Uh, so, John, thank, thank you very much. Uh, but by the way, uh, I just want to say um, this particular problem is really hard. Um, only about 20% of the uh, of the population actually gets this right. Um, the answer, it's not really that relevant. The answer was it's just any um, incrementing number uh, set of integers. That was it. Could have been like one, two, three, four, five. But th thanks, John. Um, and uh, why, this, why does this happen? Well, it turns out that... Um, yeah, sorry to sorry, put you on the spot. Again, 80% of you would have also failed at this, I promise. Um, we're falling victim to confirmation bias. And we tend to give more evidence, uh, more weight to evidence that supports our hypothesis than to contrary evidence, right? So you get a guess, you have a hypothesis, you think, oh, I think it's going to be, you know, incrementing, whatever, even numbers, right? And you'll, you'll guess lots of even numbers, but you won't think to guess odd numbers or to think of, like, decrementing negative numbers. You know, it's just a, again, it's a bug in our brains. And most of the population has this problem. It's really, I'd say it's really relevant to software engineering when you're writing your own code and you're trying to test it yourself. Um, you have your own hypotheses about where it might break and you're gonna test those really well. But you're not gonna think of other ways that, that break it. Again, you're gonna look for confirming evidence instead of contrary evidence. That, factored in with loss aversion, like you, know, you don't wanna like, lose what you've already written, um, makes it really hard to write your own code. So it's really great to, to pair with someone else um, or try to dissociate. Think of, you know, think of it as somebody else's code. How might I test it or break it? You might have a better chance of, of finding bugs in your code. Another bias that comes up a lot in life is uh, overconfidence bias. This is a phenomenon also known as the illusion of validity. Now, does anybody here think they are, I don't know, like an above average driver? Think about, we're in Massachusetts, right? Anybody <laughs> above average drivers? Okay, well, it turns out like 93% like of the population believes they are above average drivers. It's just 50%, anyway. Um, Another example, uh, mutual fund investors, like 74% of mutual fund investors, and these are like smart dudes, like mathematical, statistically inclined, they probably know all about these heuristics. They believe that they're gonna beat the market average, even though statistically, nobody beats the markets, right? It's like you have a, a coin toss, it's just as good at determining whether or not this mutual fund is, is gonna uh, exceed the, um, you know, the standard and poor, or whatever index fund you have. But yet, even though we know we're fallible, we continue to make we continue to act on these useless ideas, on these wrong concepts. Um, I also just want to point out, this, you know, this may happen, um, I don't know, I remember growing up, like my, my dad would never ask for, for directions, right, when driving. It's like you could be in a completely new area, you have never been there before, like why would you think that you know which way to go? Like we have this thought that, oh, it's roads and there's people or something and I, I must know where to go. It turns out, by the way, men tend to fall victim to this a lot more than women statistically, I don't know why, but we tend to act a lot more on our useless ideas than, um, than women do. Um, but uh, just, just something to be, to be aware of, um, as, uh, particularly as you're, as you're coding. I um, also want to point out here um, expert judgments. Um, be aware of, of expert judgments where you're going to seek an opinion from somebody else. Um, statistical measurements just almost always beat expert intuitive judgments. I mean, there's very few examples where that's not the case. If you think of problems where you have a repeated occurrence, that's where being an expert helps, like chicken sexing. Right? Everybody knows what chicken sexing is. No. Anyway, it's this weird thing where you try to figure out if a chicken's going to be a boy or a girl, and it's like, it's kind of sad. I mean, this matters for chicken farmers because they only want the girl chickens, not the boy chickens. And um, it turns out this is a really hard skill to teach someone. And the way you learn it is you pair up with another 
chicken sexing expert who will tell you if you're right or wrong. And you just do it over and over and over again. And eventually, something's happening in your system one. It's figuring out, I don't know, what, I don't know how to tell if a chicken's a boy or a girl. But um, it, it just figures it out. And uh, in this case, an expert judgment really matters because it's a repeated, um, it's a constant, you know, you got a really tight feedback loop there where you can prime your brain and develop an expert judgment. This is like not anything like any software I've ever written. Like every problem we have is always different than the one before it. You know, we never get the luxury of building the same exact system again, right? So um, beware, I mean, take it into account. Certainly, you know, architects or other engineers that have done similar projects before, um, factor in the, the objective details about why an idea might be good or bad. Um, but just beware of, the, uh, this, of this particular problem. All of these issues, if you couple them together with halo effect, just create a recipe for disaster in several programming um, or just engineering situations. Halo effect, it goes like this. We give undue merit to like beautiful or high power, like high powered people um, and, uh, or influential people way more than we uh, rationally should. And if you think for a minute, I don't know if anybody's ever done like software evaluations where, um, I don't know, they bring in like a sales guy, usually like a, I want to name, you know, big company name, brings in their high flute and sales guy. He's got like a suit on. He's got all these really fancy PowerPoints and everything else. He's got the look going, right? Halo effect. He's triggering this. He's like, I'm going to look awesome even if I don't have a clue what this software does. You're going to like me, right? Now, you couple that with like the bandwagon effect, and you get a bunch of people in the room. Maybe there's like a, I don't know, a, a CTO or a, a, I don't know, some like high, you know, engineering officer or somebody like that starts hearing what they say and nods their head a little bit. And then you look around the room, and everybody else is like nodding a little bit, right? It's like, no, 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 this is bad. You need to go into these situations with an objective list of criteria that you agree upon beforehand. So you're not swayed by like this fancy new feature they have that you don't really value. But man, he's got an awesome, awesome look and this guy sounds awesome. So the product therefore must be awesome. No, um, just, uh, just keep an eye out for that. And um, also know that this plays a, a really important role with interviewing. I'm sure many developers are you guys are, are involved in, in evaluating candidates. Beware of the expert judgment. I mean, unless you're interviewing and evaluating like lots and lots and lots of candidates consistently with a tight feedback loop for the same position, the same job, expert judgments don't count for much. You're much better off statistically if you go in with a set of like five to seven criteria that you agree on are valuable and everybody goes in with a plan to evaluate them on those criteria. And if they come in and they're like awesome prolog programmers, but that's not on your criteria, don't factor it in. Not no diss on prolog, right? If you like prolog, you're probably an awesome, creative, curious engineer, and that's cool, and that should factor in. But but this extra language skill that sounds really cool shouldn't shouldn't play a role in your decision making. Now, uh, I don't know if you guys look, look at Hacker News or Y Combinator. Anyway, the founder, Paul Graham, um, has said once, he's, one of his co-founders, um, Robert Morris, he said, this guy is my hero because he's never wrong. I'm thinking to myself, what do you mean never wrong? How can you always be right? I don't know. Neil deGrasse Tyson doesn't know, right? My point here is these three words, or I guess it's like four, the contraction. I don't know. There's extreme value in saying these words, um, particularly in engineering circles. I mean, I'm sure you've all been in a meeting maybe where, I don't know, a bunch of managers are there and it's like some high important issue and they turn to you, developer, and they're like, Rich, what is the replication factor on our production Cassandra cluster? And you're like, three? Three? Yeah, three, it's three. Oh yeah, it's three. Yeah, just say I don't know. And have you ever noticed that like really smart people are really good at saying that more often? You know, be accurate, be like a scientist, right? You know, there's never anything is 100% accurate. Like, pretend like you're a scientist, say I don't know a lot and explore your curiosity. Now earlier I gave you guys a poll and I asked, um, generally what's the percentage chance that an engineer will change their mind once they've voiced their opinion? Well, this kind of gets back to the uh, illusion of validity and overconfidence bias. We change our minds far less often than we think. And once you voice your opinion, you're like anchoring yourself to that. You've now invested capital in it, social capital. You go back to the ancestral environment, right? You know, you say we got some idea. If you backtrack on it, not only you've got loss aversion going, like your ego is now in, in there and the tribe might like kick you out, right? So once you voice a solution or an opinion, um, it's really hard to backtrack on it. 
So there's a really cool trick for this. If you're ever in brainstorming uh, scenarios where you're trying to figure out how to solve a problem, it's great if teams agree on this. Spend five minutes by the clock, not like five minutes, about five, like literally time it on a clock. Spend five minutes talking about the problem without raising a single solution. Trust me, it works. You will, what, what happens is if you voice your solutions early, you're going you're gonna to be stuck on those and you're going to start rationalizing and debating. These are like, rationalize, by the way, is like, is like calling lying, truth telling. It has nothing to do with being rational, right? When you're, when you're debating with people, you're not trying to discover truth. Surprise, we didn't evolve to like find universal truth. No, we evolved to debate, to triumph and win and, and prevent everybody else from uh, you know, stepping in and giving their ideas. So when you hold off on proposing solutions, you won't be um, as inclined. It won't be as hard to take those solutions back and think objectively about other solutions that might come up down the road. So again, five minute timer, really big. I'm um, just switch gears here to the, to the results of that poll. Ooh, here we go. Refresh. Something went wrong. <laughs> oh, bummer. Well, that would have been really cool. OK. Um, so anyway, I'll just give you the, the trick. And this won't be nearly as exciting, but you get the idea. Um, I asked half of you, um, is there more or less than a 3% chance that, you will, um, that you'll change your mind? after voicing your opinion. And the other half of you I asked, is there more or less than a 65% chance that you'll change your mind? And then I asked everybody to fill in their actual guess. I didn't care about the response to the first question. I only cared about the number you put in. And um, it turns out, this is called the anchoring effect, and it's demonstrated and it's repeatable enough that I was really confident to like try it out on you guys, um, where um, just asking that question and putting the word like 65% there, it's in your system one, it's cached. It's available. You're not going to be able to get it out of your mind. So when you try to come up with a guess, you're going to be weighted far more towards 65%. Likewise, the 3% folks, um, you're going to give a number more closely related to that 3% number. So if you guys do planning poker and anybody goes, you know, gives like a story point estimate, you got to like call foul. you got to like throw the estimate out because now they've anchored everybody. And as much as you try and, and studies show that even among like rational communities where they know this is happening to them, the bias is still like 20, 30%. It's ridiculous how much you're swayed by this anchoring effect. So just keep that in mind. Um, why are we doing on time? We got five minutes? All right. The last part of this talk, I'm gonna go over a little bit about the autonomic nervous system. Um, this is that fight or flight response. Um, it's responsible for um, like our, more of our involuntary responses that happen. Now picture for a minute, you know, you're not a software engineer, but you are, you know, like homo sapiens in the ancestral environment, and there's like a tiger over there, and he's going to come get you, right? And what happens, right? Maybe you got a club or something, you know, in your hand. You see this tiger, like, oh, man, oh, man, what's happening? Well, as part of your autonomic uh, nervous system, it's your uh, sympathetic nervous system, it's this branch of it, is kicking into high gear. And what's going to happen? Well, you're... Your body is, you're going to start to like tense up. Your like shoulders are going are gonna to hunch forward. You'll start to protect like your abdomen area. Your, um, your heart rate is going to increase. You're going to get dry mouth. Your um, eyes, your pupils will start to dilate. You'll get sweat on your, on your arms. Your blood vessels are going to contract and pull everything away from everything that's not absolutely essential to survival, right? Including that system two part of your brain that thinks rationally, right? So you're like all system one. You're like, man, do I club this? thing or do I run, right? And what happens? You know, you're like, I'm running. So you run, you run, 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 run. You're going, you're going, you're going. And then like, I don't know, 20 minutes later, you look behind you, is he gone? Is he gone, right? Okay, he's gone. Oh, all right. Your parasympathetic nervous system is now kicking in. You're sort of shifting the spectrum over to the other side. You're a lot calmer. Your heart rate's going lower. You're engaging your system too. Your rational part of your brain is like in high gear now because it's thinking, what did I do to get myself near a tiger and how do I make sure I don't do that again, right? This is a great mindset, by the way, to be in for solving problems. That initial mindset, that system one, the tiger is there, not good. You don't have system two. So to relate this to software engineering, your boss comes in and he's like, Oh my God, there's a production outage. We got to get all hands on deck. The money's just like flowing out the window, right? Like everybody here, you're staying all night. You're going to fix this thing. We got to get it done. We're going to get status updates every two minutes and your heart rate's going like, oh man, okay, okay. What's happening? You know, blood's moving away from your brain. The one thing you need to fix that problem. It's not engaged at all. 
Like, this is bad on like every level, right? That's my point here. Be aware of these changes in your nervous system. Be aware of you know, things like your heart rate, maybe intense breathing. Um, if you're stressed, if you're overtired, um, when you're trying to come up with rational solutions to problems, you may need to step away. Ask, ask somebody else to, to give it a shot. And um, being aware of this and also um, teaching people about this effect, uh, hopefully we can create more, a more calm environment for solving critical mission defect um, issues so we can solve them faster and more correctly in the future. So just a recap, uh, we went over the brain, talked about our system one and system two, a new way of thinking about how you think, think about when those two systems are engaged. And uh, we went over loss aversion, several bugs in our brains, and, uh, and some techniques for avoiding them, um, as well as some hacks here like trigger action plans. Uh, maybe think about next time you're saying, I should do this or I should do that. Set up a trigger action plan. Come up with some incremental step towards that goal. And uh, also the value of saying, I don't know, and spend five minutes thinking before you anchor yourself with a solution. And, uh, and by the way, if you're interested in this topic, um, a lot of stuff online, um, check out rationality.org, lesswrong.com. Um, also, if, you wanna, uh, if you're interested in giving to charities, I suggest checking out givewell.org. Uh, they take a rational approach to evaluating charities to maximize the amount of, uh, or minimize the amount of human suffering um, uh, that's, that's happening in the world. So take a look at that. Um, any questions, come up to me anytime, ask me anything. You can follow me on, uh, on the Twitter and uh, that's it. Thank you, guys. And gambling, when you have less than a 50% chance of winning, why do you do that? Um, I don't know why. I'm trying to think, of like, and like, why did we evolve to do this kind of behavior? Um, it could be, at, right, sure. Everybody thinks they're above average. You think that you're beating the system. You have some, some fallible, like, some fallible reason why you're doing it, and uh, you're able to justify or rationalize to yourself that you're going to be able to win the next time. Um, it's just pure junk. And even when you know that's happening, you tell gamblers, like, hey, this isn't statistically right. Like, mathematically, this isn't going to work, and you, you do it anyway. Um, so it's yeah, just really big problem. And uh, like I said, you, know, you can't even convince, like, Wall Street that they're doing the wrong thing. Just invest your resources somewhere else. Um, thank you, everybody. Hope you enjoyed it.